So let me quickly introduce our panel to you. We have the head of national development for the Public Investment Fund, Jerry Todd, is with us. Lovely to see you, Jerry. From Aquapower, the vice chairman and the CEO, Patty um, Padmanathan. Lovely to see you as always, Patty. I'm absolutely delighted to have His Royal Highness with us, Sultan bin Khalid Al Saud. He is the deputy CEO of the Saudi Industrial Development Fund and Faisal Sultan, the managing director of Lucid Motors. So thank you so much, gentlemen. Jerry, if I might start with you. And when we look at you know, the work that's going on with the Public Investment Fund. We heard from the chairman this morning. But if you might maybe define for us that wider economic impact that you're looking to make, and particularly from an investor perspective. Uh, thank you. Uh, pleasure to be here, Edna, with you and my colleagues. <clears throat> uh, so if you think about Vision 2030, it's a blueprint for an economic transition. And PIF sits within that context. So we're an enabler for that. Uh, we can put capital to work. Uh, we also have the ability to partner with international companies. Um, and we're also, we have the ability to operate through our portfolio companies. And so um, the job that we have to do is to enable that transition. And we do that through sectors. So if you think uh, of, of the maturity of a sector on the spectrum from uh, import oriented uh, with little local value add all the way through to a globally competitive, globally relevant, uh, export-oriented business. Our job across our 13 priority sectors is to move to the right, right? So we invest to move to the right, and we do that. The vector is companies. So we, we partner with local and international companies that are leaders in their field. Uh, we have existing companies in our portfolio anyway, like uh, Saudi Telecom and Saudi National Bank. Um, and where we see gaps, uh, we start up companies. And so the job that those companies then have to do um, is to build uh, economically viable businesses uh, and in the process advance the sectors in which they operate. And I like that, move to, move to the right. We can have a few different meanings on <laughs> moving to the right to do the right thing and all of that. So we are keeping you very, very busy right now. huh? Um, Patty, you know, as an investor here in the KSA, you know, first and foremost, you're a businessman. Um, you might not be a ruthless businessman, but you are a businessman at heart. You know, how do you factor, I suppose, that wider concept of economic good into a business decision? Privilege and pleasure to be here with you. Um, fantastic question. So for us, we see absolutely no difference. In fact, it is in exactly by involving the community, the people, the, our supply chain, the entire ecosystem that we can de-risk our investments. So the company I'm privileged to uh, lead is a company that develops, owns, and operates power generation, diesel water production, and green hydrogen plants. So we make massive investments for the long term. We, get our, we, we spend billions up front, and we get it back over 25, 35 years, typically in assets that are built in the middle of nowhere. But in the middle of nowhere, you have people. And Regardless of whether it's a rich country or a poor country, you will find the most disadvantaged living in those remote places. So we go in there, we put massive investments in the middle of nowhere. For 25 to 35 years, we're going to live in that community. No amount of guard wires, <coughs> uh, uh, barbed wires, guard dogs are going to protect you. You really need to work with the community and bring them along with you and part partner with them. Now, immediately people say, oh, that's cost. No. Time and time again, we have proven that it is actually less expensive if we are able to bring them in and utilize their services, develop them, train them, all the way through to maximizing local content, maximizing talent development, all the way through. So for us, it's very much our core business, not just in the kingdom, but in the 13 countries we operate in. It's about de-risking and it's about reducing cost by focusing on what now is being called the real return on investment, the inclusive shared prosperity, uh, because that is what creates the value. We'll talk a lot more about that. Faisal, um, first of all, congratulations on the launch of your showroom. I don't know if you've any of you have been in a lucid car but it's pretty smart, so it is. And the fact that they're going to be rolling off 
the production line in Saudi Arabia next year. I mean, how exciting is that? Cool. But talk to me about how investors, and you particularly, you know, how can you adopt, I suppose, an approach to delivering returns to your shareholders? Because that's why people are looking at this sector. They're going to come in. You know, they see the concept of actual return on investment. And again, building in that social impact, you know, w without breaking the business model completely, because there still has to be an underlying business model there. So, uh, pleasure to be here, and good afternoon, everyone. Look, you know, the world is moving towards this new order, and I think we've been hearing about this today. I think for businesses to thrive, they have to really realize that human capital, the localization, uh, vertical integration, these are real things. And this actually, in the long run, help you become a very healthy business. Yep. So it, it, up front, it's a little bit of an investment, but the returns actually do return to you in the long term. And it, it's not a burden. I think you know that, that was the old way of thinking. And again, I suppose some investors might think that that might be the burden, but I think when they are here and they look at it in the long term, like any investment decision, well, and it, it has to go both ways, right? It's a partnership. So here in the region, it's very obvious. The government, the investors, they work together greatly. Uh, PIF is a great example. SIDF is another great example. And we have many institutions like this that is gelling together and making, bringing these businesses in, in the country. And Your Highness, purposely, I wanted you to hear some of the work that everybody is doing the way now I ask you to look at it from I suppose the government point of view, because there's a process there, there, is, there's a, there are plans, I mean, all of course heading towards 2050, but also when we look at the financial institution perspective, you know, how do you look at the wider economic growth development and what do you need, I'm putting it, I suppose, in the government perspective and then how do you move on and take that mantle and make sure that it's fulfilled? So sure, thank you, Athena, it's a pleasure to be here as well and uh, it's also a pleasure to have some of our clients here. Uh, so the Saudi Industrial Development Fund is a development finance institution. So the core of what we fundamentally do is to provide long-term project finance, primarily to greenfield projects in the manufacturing, energy, mining, and logistics sectors. And all these are underpinned, our priorities are underpinned by the grander national strategies in that regard. However, the core to our mandate is the fundamental economic impact that's created by the projects that we, that we fund. And so whether it's the new sectors that we unlock or whether it's the contribution to manufacturing value add or whether it's the, uh, the human capital development and employment opportunities they create. I think what's obviously very interesting here is funding and finance is, is only one dimension. There is most certainly a role for investors and allocators of risk capital to play. There's certainly a role for private sector enterprises to play, and there's a role for government to play. Now, it's difficult to align incentives across a variety of different stakeholders, but there are multiple approaches to do so. Lucid facility in the kingdom is one example of that, where we, th we hope to unlock the automotive industry. There are other examples. One, which is a story I enjoy telling, is in the renewable value chain as well, and I hope we can come to speak to that. And again, I mean, we want to look at, you know, the work particularly on um, Sakaka as well, which, you know, you were very involved in. Patty, would you elaborate perhaps and, you know, talk to us about some of the, you know, there's been great opportunities here, but possibly a few challenges along the way as well. You know, the work that you put in to bring these projects to life. Look, I, I think, um, so, Lots of opportunities, and they come complete with challenges, right? So let's start. Uh, give you a quick um, sort of uh, couple of examples. One is Saudi Arabia is a huge consumer of desalination because we don't have surface water. Uh, a substantial amount of water we consume in this country is desalinated. So one of the processes, the main process that desalinates water, uses a fairly sophisticated membrane, and this membrane is capex, but also opex intensive in that we have to replace it every six to, uh, five to six years. Even though it, is, it consumes nearly 30% of all membranes manufactured in the world, till 2006, 
it was manufactured in Japan, right. United States, and Germany, but no longer Germany. Um, and it was very remarkable to us. Why? Why is it manufactured? In, because when you talk to the, the technology providers, manufacturers, it's rocket science. It's complicated. It's finely meshed fabric, da di da di da Underneath it all, what is the basic ingredient that goes? The fiber that comes from Sabik. So the fiber comes from Sabik, gets exported to Japan, gets knit into fabrics, right. and comes straight back, a significant quantity, into the kingdom. A it bit of a convoluted way of doing it, it and it ends up it back to you at a high price, huh? It took, uh, yeah, I don't want to say the multiple. Huh? So <laughs> it took us six years of fighting, persuading, cajoling, pushing, uh, threatening, uh, <laughs> to eventually break, I don't want to say the monopoly, yes. get one um, right-minded, visionary company to actually then step in and put a plant in the kingdom and start producing. Surprise, surprise, they found that, you know, it is, turns out to be cheaper. They are able to make more profit and still supply it at a lower price. And no sooner have they started assembling, all the others came. So we now have all of them with manufacturing capacity in the kingdom. And we've had the same experience with Sakaka. The, f the first, the very first renewable energy plant built in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, I don't want to call it a toy, 300 megawatts, so that's big. But in the scale of things that we are now doing, it's a small plant. But just on that first project itself, we managed to push the suppliers of the tracker, the piece that moves the thing. Again, supposedly rocket science, but it turns out it's not. Um, it is precision engineering, but it can be done here. Anyway, convince one to eventually come and put a plant in here. They put a plant in here, supply to that 300 megawatts project. Today, they export from here to the United States. It's an American company that came from here, brought the technology, manufacturing, now supplying in the region as well as exporting. Of course, now we've got more of them coming. So now the next biggest Spanish tracker company is setting up a plant in the kingdom. So, and why are they doing it? it well, I'd like to think it's just because that's also the right thing to do, but I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's the money, it's yep. the risk, the de-risking and the cost competitiveness of, so I think it's extremely important and what the kingdom is doing, incentivizing, offering a, lo uh, a fantastic ecosystem is all the right thing to do. But ultimately, yeah. it is the most profitable thing to do. And I think when we see the development <coughs> that's happening in this region, possibly when they came in the beginning, no matter if they were brought kicking and screaming in, they came and they stayed. But I think for them at this point now to really be looking, and it's a great example to other companies. Yeah, well, look, the world has moved on, right? Yes. So quickly, all of a sudden, 300 megawatts in 2009, uh, sorry, 2018. Now we are busy implementing a 70 gigawatt, 70,000 megawatt program in the kingdom to be implemented within the next uh, eight years. So, yeah, absolutely. And this is a project, um, Jerry, obviously, you know, you're involved with as well. Talk to us about, I suppose, maximizing that value creation when companies come here. Uh, thank you, Edna. <coughs> This is a great example because yeah. they fought to make this happen. And they fought to make this happen in the absence of anyone telling them, you must do this. Right? They did it no purely incentives. to and make no their supply chains uh, more resilient um, and to, uh, uh, to try to lower costs ultimately uh, to their consumers. So, uh, and the demonstration is um, strategic thinking, creativity, willpower, uh, negotiating skills. Long-term mindset. But also leverage. So demand creates leverage. When you have demand in country, that creates the leverage that you can then use. We've had demand for a long time. We haven't always, across all of our companies, been as creative and as strong-willed as we could have been. Yeah. But the demand is there and the demand is growing. If you just take, for example, uh, construction, which is gonna be you know, a very large and important um, uh, a demand uh, center over the next uh, 15 plus years um, between what PIF is doing, what Riyadh uh, um, 
the, the Royal Commission for Riyadh Center Cities doing, uh, the business as usual demand uh, in private and, and public sector, we're going to be entering into a golden age for, for construction, and that's going to create enormous opportunities. Today, two-thirds of that money flows outside the kingdom. Right. Every time we spend on, on building something between imported products, imported services, imported labor, two-thirds flows out. Uh, we'll probably spend, you know, make up a number, a trillion reals over the next 15 years. So there's a very large pie uh, uh, for the local market to, to capture. And, of course, I mean, and bringing it back. I mean, that was probably a combination of Patty's sort of charm and, and influence. And, and, and coming with the data and the facts, I mean, I think more than anything else, you know, and his power of persuasion that uh, we know he can do. So well done on, on that, a great example. Um, Your Highness, talk to me about, I mean, listening to these stories, I suppose, you know, building these partnerships that are essential, building in the wider economic growth, because it's not just about these companies being profitable. What do they build around that? You know, what's the resilience in terms of society, in terms of bringing, you know, all of this together? Because it's more holistic than just attracting companies to make money here, isn't it? No, absolutely. And uh, before that, if we just take a step back, I would just like to add to the, the, the example of SCACA. Please. Um, and maybe look at a wider picture. So I think this is something, I, I love this story because everything worked so well from the government's perspective, from the private sector perspective, and for people willing to underwrite the risk. Right. So I think the government and the Ministry of Energy did a marvelous job when they thought about, we're ambitious, we want to achieve a, a target of 70 gigawatts by 2030. And so what they fundamentally did is three things. The first is they created a buyer for the energy. The second is they ran a process a competitive process. And so these were projects that were tendered. And what you fundamentally made your bids on was the price that you were going to sell the electricity to the buyer. The third is inclusive in the tendering process was a local content requirement. And so, yeah, with all due appreciation, but for SCACA in particular, that local content requirement was virtually small. So Aqua could have satisfied it very easily. But these the projects, the 70 gigawatts, were split into waves. And each wave of projects escalated in numbers and size. And similarly, it was by design that the local content requirements would escalate similarly and become more specific. So it gave visibility, it ran a competitive process, and for that single component, the trackers and the frames, it represents around 15% of the, of the cost of the panel. Yeah. 15% of the cost of the panel. For SCACA, all, all, all the people that ended up investing had to invest double the amount of the entirety of the size of the project. But if they believed in the fundamentally the, the pipeline, that's billions of dollars in terms of the market. And so that, that fundamental process, aligning the incentives and making sure that they sit with the people that know who can do what, uh, helps obviously in, uh, in achieving them. So I think SICACA is phenomenal from there. It shows what the government can do, what sort of incentive system, and the role that the private sector can fundamentally play. Now, what was the outcome? So at the time of awarding, and this is to show that this is not a zero-sum game. At the time of awarding, SICACA was the cheapest yes. price of electricity globally. And every other project that followed in that program achieved a similar record. And what's also interesting, so the story does not end there. And so now the private players learn. So one of the companies that invested in developing the tracker systems has already now invested and we've lent it now to do something similar where? In wind. And so now they're building uh, they're, 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 they're participating in the wind supply chain and they're building the metal towers. These are 300 meters of length and they represent around 20% of the entirety of the cost of the wind turbine. So you can, it's not zero sum. There's a role for us to play. And I think this signifies the example. Beyond that, I think we're doing much more. So I'm very much excited about the heavy industries that we're building in the eastern province, whether it's the maritime, the casting and forging, 
and the steel plates. I'm also excited about the development of the automotive supply chain. This is not only Lucid. We're hoping to have two more OEMs and further developments in the, in the value chain there as well. I'm also very interested in the work that we're doing as well with Aqua in developing one of the largest, if not the largest, green hydrogen facilities in Neom. All of these will contribute tremendously to unlocking new sectors, creating better jobs, and adding to economic complexity of all the things that we do in the economy. And again, I really do look at that, I think, as the, you know, you have to look at what's happening in Saudi Arabia with a more holistic lens, I think. There's a big focus, you know, on 2030, and that's, that's almost just your starting block right now. Then you have to look beyond that. So it is, it's very exciting. Um, Faisal, again, you know, talk to me a little bit about the partnerships that are in place there and how, you know, you can hopefully then contribute to building your own supply chain as well. You know, your, I mean, this is part of the big transition to sustainability for the kingdom, of course, part of what you're doing. But there's also just listening to the, the stories of, you know, b just by chance, well, not by chance, but building those supply chains. How important is that and what can you do about it? Well, I think um, the partnerships that I mentioned in the last answer, you know, with the investors and the government, I think what they do is they give you the start that you need because there is this negative perception about the region, right? And I think that that perception needs to really go away. We are all examples of that, that we can thrive as a business in the, in the kingdom. Um, supply chain is, is very important. As, as, as Patty mentioned, as, as His uh, Highness mentioned, as Jerry mentioned, I think uh, the, the whole game is now going to be played in the supply chain and vertical integration. Um, and then uh, at Lucid, we're all about vertical integration, having major components of our vehicle in-house, but then have the strategic partnerships with our suppliers very close to us. COVID taught us a couple of things. You cannot have your suppliers, you know, thousands and thousands of miles away from you. So um, logistics, there is a lot of logistic works that is happening in the kingdom. There is a lot of supply chain attraction that is happening. Uh, I think recently, few of the suppliers in automotive have already started signing, which is really a good sign for a company like Lucid and other OEMs that are going to be coming into the kingdom in the future. That is what's going to make us competitive when we have our supply chain in the kingdom and that full value chain that we talk about. And automotive is a, a huge value chain. You talk from basic materials, as Patty was mentioning, a lot of the SABIC material goes to China, goes to Japan, goes to Germany, goes to US, and then becomes a mirror and comes back right here. So we want to change that. We want to have our vehicles, our suppliers, have those materials used. And I mean, the opportunities are very clear. But Patty, for yourself, clearly this is you know, a success story and there, there are many we can share. But for other would-be investors in the region, what are you looking for? And if there is more that the government could do, there's always more the government can do. They're going to tell me there's more that you can do afterwards. But what could they do to actually, you know, help speed this? Because I think speed is of the essence as well right now. Absolutely right. So the, the big issue that I think the world is going to see already facing is that the, uh, particularly, for example, in the energy transition, but it applies to the whole sector of infrastructure development. There's a massive need, there's a massive backlog, and there's a massive demand that needs to be fulfilled. But partly coming out of COVID, partly fueled by the energy crisis, we have a huge supply demand gap. We are already seeing it in the form of massive volatility in prices and so on. That needs to get ramped up, not just a bit, by many times. Solar, solar panel making capacity needs to be ramped up by eight times if you really want to achieve the climate goals that everybody signed up to. So, in ramping up those, there is enormous space for all these people to deploy and set up capacity around the world where the consumption is going to be. So for, for, company, for entities like PIF, for SIDF, they're already doing it in order to accelerate that uptake. The process that we use of cajoling, and it is a very slow process, persuading. It took us, I mean, this, this, win, this win story that your highness just now mentioned, it took us two and a half years to, fine, we had a willing participant on the other side, by the way, and yet it took us. Whereas, 
if there is a little bit of support as it is as there is now there's a good ecosystem developing in the kingdom and more countries should be doing similar things i think we can accelerate that so that's one thing but i think the piece that governments and certainly in the kingdom again they are starting to do it but you need to do it 10 times more in my view talent the war for talent is going to multiply and is going to really get out of control and we are going to be constrained in what we yes. can do simply because we are not going to have the project managers we are not going to have the developers we are not going to have the engineer hold that one because i do want to ask you all about talent in just a minute but okay. I mean, it's essential but just very quickly if there was anything that the government could do to actually help private players you know that would actually help speed it on and maybe in terms of also bringing in you know small medium business yes but you know bringing in startups and what what can the government do to to sort of help you and help other private companies i think some of that is already happening but it needs to happen faster and uh, i think that's correct i think it it needs to happen much faster because we're competing as a country and as a region with uh, you know a multiple countries um it's the infrastructure i think there there is a definitely need for infrastructure development so supply chain is one infrastructure is one and then enabling policies um so you know support let's keep that on the side right because every time we come and we say we need support but i think these are key ingredients that really would accelerate the change over you know that the saudi green initiative is a great great example of of a policy that will help the ecosystem for having sustainable transportation you know becoming a main player in 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 the country those type of policies enablers i think are is is what is really needed and your highness from the government point of view you know you're probably constantly reviewing how you're working and how you're building efficiency into what you're doing but also when you look at private investors coming here i mean are they coming in with the right financing do they have the right plans what would make your life easier to actually help them you know is there anything lacking there in terms of what you need on the other side so so i think the my key message is invest and you have a willing partner on the other end of it as it relates to us in particular i think what we've done in the past 4 years in terms of our lending is equivalent to what we've done in the previous 35 wow wow um today our pipeline is the largest it has ever been and that's something that we continue to scale now we will always have fundamental issues that need resolving and we will always find issues that we can do better at but i think the entirety of the ecosystem of government today in the kingdom is one that is flexible one that is agile and one that is responsive not in term not in terms of funding alone but the entirety of the regulatory framework is also being reworked to become conducive for business and to accelerate the development of the kingdom from a pif point of view again what do you what do you look for when you're looking for good partners whereby you can bring in and help well again the vehicle that we have our impact uh, uh through no pun intended uh our yeah. our operating companies right the the yeah. companies we invest in and so uh what we look for them to do um is to create that economic sustainability um that allows them uh to be a credible partner to their supply chain uh allows them to invest in talent um and allows them to take a long-term view right and so we try to be patient capital uh we 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 try not to overfund but also not underfund we try to strike the right balance um and as a uh not a policy maker at the government level but as someone who could provide direction at the level of our portfolio uh we roll out um uh programs for them to invest so that our double bottom line as as PIF our our you know reason for being uh, uh as part of vision 2030 uh, uh gets prioritized and 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 driven through them Now let's um look at the talent because technology all the great technology in the world can't save you if you don't have the right people. And again, it is an issue worldwide as you mentioned Patty but in this region bringing people to Saudi Arabia making sure they have the right skills. Where's the big challenge there? What are you finding? Look, I think the challenge for us is 
the region is starting to attract because everything is happening here and uh, this is uh, becoming less and lesser of an issue. But for us, what is more concerning is we want it to be an enduring solution. We can't sort of build this country or any country on the back of expatriates uh, being, on a, being supplied on a regular basis forever, right? So, and the pro what I was going with the talent story is, so supply chain reconfiguring, building more capacity is, can be done and it is getting done within a kind of five to 10 year time frame. Talent on the other hand is a generational matter. Yeah. Okay, now that really governments have to get behind. The kingdom is doing it by transforming its curriculum, pushing more and more people into science and technology and into arts. I'm not just saying science and technology just because I'm an engineer is the right thing. You need the, all the full faculty of skills, but transforming the curriculum system, getting more people into the education system, really taking care on how they get developed beyond just education. So all of that, government, needs to drive that. Private sector absolutely can support, but, and it will, because otherwise we'll die. So we have to invest and we, we do invest. And it's, again, it's not about an additional cost. It's about our own de-risking and our own uh, cost reduction measures. But it really needs massive, massive government support and focus. And so many new business are coming here. Automotion, um, Automotive is new here, so where are you going to get that talent? And what are you doing then, you know, as a company? What are you doing to make sure that you can grow it? So I'll, I'll go back to partnerships again, because PIF and, and Lucid actually started uh, an internship <coughs> partnership, and uh, we actually send young Saudi talent. We've had two batches of um, engineers sent to um, our headquarters in, in the Newark, California, and also in our uh, AMP1 manufacturing plant in Arizona. And, and, I, and that's really to reinforce having the local workforce be ready when we have our 155,000 you know, uh, a year volume plant up and running in King Abdullah Economic City. We absolutely cannot depend on expats coming in all the time, leaving, coming, leaving, coming. Need retained local workforce. And there are other programs that we're working, so we plan on continuing this partnership with PIF. We have our own internship program. Um, we currently have uh, more than half of our workforce that is sitting in Saudi is, is, uh, is a Saudi talent uh, that is being <coughs> trained by our trainers who are coming from US. So that is an absolute key. I think no business can say that they can thrive um, you know, with support and then supply chain if we don't have that pillar taken care of. Now, um, th your chairman and His Excellency Al Ramayan said today, this morning, he was talking <coughs> about the need for the economic multiplier effect, um, effect and to try and make sure that you're building not just more jobs, but good quality jobs as well. How high is that on your agenda? Well, clearly it is if he's talking about it today. It is now. Um, so uh, the, the sectors that we chose uh, at, at kind of the, the PIF level, which were uh, um, approved by our board, uh, were selected for a reason, right? So these are all sectors where there's room to go in the kingdom, there's room for us to advance. Um, and those sectors are important globally. Uh, we believe we can be relevant uh, 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 at a global level. Um, and there's sectors in which if you get it right, money bounces <coughs> around. Right? So if you have a, an import-oriented uh, business model, you know, the money bounces around once. And, and, and that once is you know, outside. Um, if you have, as, as uh, my colleagues were saying, uh, increasingly deep supply chains locally, the money bounces around <coughs> in the kingdom. And every bounce <coughs> is a revenue for someone else. That's a business there that employs people. Uh, Patty and Faisal are not running charity businesses, so those suppliers have to deliver on time, at quality, on cost, which means they have to be competitive. And it is that you know, unleashing <coughs> of entrepreneurial capitalism across the entire ecosystem uh, that creates the type of jobs that ultimately uh, uh, will be meaningful and satisfying to employees. Long lasting. And clearly in the kingdom, I mean, I think we've seen it in, in every sector, the need to build talent capacity. This is from, yes, industry, manufacturing, 
arts, creativity, you know, bringing academia in. Yeah. It's a very exciting time, I think, for people here. How important is it and what are you doing, you know, with the development fund to, to I suppose, raise that level whereby you're making sure that you're building the talent necessary for the future? So I think it's pivotal, and I think we've heard it today, <coughs> excuse me, and, 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 uh, and mul multiple times. So I think it, it begins with investing in people, and it ends with creating a better reality, more opportunities and possibilities for them. And I think that notion underpins every aspect of the kingdom's vision. So at SIDF, we are we're primarily a financial institution that offers money. But over the past three years, we've actually extended our training the program to more than 8,000 recipients across private and public institutions from over 400 institutions within the kingdom. And that's not an SIDF story. I think that's a Saudi Arabia story today. And that's something we take tremendous pride in. And I think it's, it's also important to look at the things that we celebrate as a country to signify the importance. So one of the, one of the things that we all celebrated in Saudi Arabia in 2021 was the fact that our pre-college students, some of which, by the way, are speaking at FII this year, went on to the US at one of the largest international forums, the International Science and Engineering Fair. 80 countries represented, 1,800 participants, and Saudi Arabia finished second. I think that's important validation, that that, that journey starts early, and that we're getting the results that we see, but it's a continuous investment that we will always make. And clearly it's about putting Saudi Arabia on the international map, being competitive in terms of your products and services here. And again, I think bringing that attention to a country like this. So keep up the good work on that. Yes. We have to start wrapping this up, you know, breaks my heart. There's so much more I know we can talk about and it's just, I find every time I come here, it's just so exciting because the economy is so dynamic, what's happening is so dynamic and people are so invested, you know, in terms of everything they're doing here. It's, it truly is, there's so much happening here. But Patty, if you were to, I suppose, put out a, a call to action <coughs> in terms of, you know, we're coming close to the end of the year. Again, we start off 2023, gets us closer to 2030. <coughs> What is that call to action, I suppose, that you would say? I think the call to action is very straightforward. Huh? So everybody must look at return on investment in a holistic manner. It's very simple. We all do it, to be fair. Uh, all corporates, uh, big or small, think about it. They kind of do it in compartmentalized. You know, particularly now, we've created much more confusion by starting to talk about ESG as if it's just another chapter and something else that we need to. It all needs to come together. And for me, it's, again, if you correctly, accurately evaluate your holistic return on investment, you're going to find that by investing in supply chain, investing in the community, investing in the way you procure, and in focusing on reducing the cost of what you supply, you're going to create maximum value to yourself at the same time as creating maximum value to society around you. That's a nice do-good thing, but ultimately, you can create maximum value by de-risking and real bottom line profit. You can see it year after year, and it's enduring. That's the next important point. It's not something that's just for the next one year or two cycles. That's very exciting, and I think, again, if it's not that way, and for you, I think this must be so exciting. Because it is. How many years I've known you do this, and bringing it all together, um, you know, it's almost like the gift of how you've always wanted to work, I think. Yes, and it is, and we see the result. Um, I welcome everybody to look at the Aquapar share prices. <laughs> and, and keep it that way, too. Talk to me a little bit again, you know, if there was a, a call to action in terms of, for you're, you're entering a new business here, which again is very, very exciting for the kingdom. And I think there'll be great excitement when that first car rolls off. But beyond that, what's next? I, you know, I think uh, uh, Patty hit it, uh, you know, right there he basically it's all about the holistic approach as we started this conversation we all said that you have to really look at the long-term picture so you're only helping yourself in investing in human capital you're only investing yourself by having supply chain and logistics close to you and well-defined um, you 
you're basically de-risking the, uh, the, 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 your business at the end of the day. Uh, you will survive. You know, you will, if there are, there are storms that come, economic storms, you will be ready to, to take on them if you have these pillars because they are the solid pillars of the business that make the building strong. If you don't have them and you're dependent on, you know, just, just being here to meet the requirement is not good enough anymore. And indeed, when we look around the world today, I think there's a few storms brewing around the world. We're probably protected a little bit here in terms of like, that strong economic growth, the foreign and direct investment that's coming into Saudi like at its best in 10 years, and perhaps inflation not as bad as in other places. But still, anything that happens in one part of the world will have a knock-on effect here. Just in closing, talk to me a little bit about what's going to make your life easier for the next while, if, if that's possible because there's so much on the agenda. Yeah. But what are you looking forward to? And again, if there's a call to action, what would it be? Well, I mean, first of all, it makes it interesting and something worth achieving. Um, but I think the call for action is, yes, the holistic approach, but a number of realities have to be recognized, I think. One, it's not a cost of doing business. No. It's actually an investment, as we've heard. No. I think the second is, to uplift people and to create economic impact, we fundamentally have to grow, right? And the question is how to make that growth more inclusive. And I think that rests on any approach you use fundamentally has to consider three main things. I think the first, what are the incentives for the various stakeholders? And I think the second, how is the risk allocated and shared? And the third, how does everybody share in the benefits? And when you get these three right, and when I think everybody can see that clearly, it, uh, it, it drives everybody towards success. So that's very exciting. I'm going to leave you a closing word here in terms of, you know, what is that call to action? What do we need to do next? I mean, there's grand plans uh, for PIF. Uh, you're looking at, you know, local content. You're looking at new business. I mean, it, it is nonstop. So talk to me for what's next and what are you hoping um, that you can leave us a, a few words of wisdom. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, no, I'd really like to thank my fellow panelists for the, the leadership they've shown, the impact they're having. Um, <clears throat> when I uh, first joined the PIF about three years ago, I had to put together a, a strategy uh, for delivering national uh, impact. Um, and as I was presenting that to my boss, the governor, at some point he stops me and he says, uh, Jerry, you, you keep saying billions, but the slide says trillions. And I realized in 25 years in the private sector, I had never said trillions before. It wasn't <laughs> part of my vocabulary, but at the time frame we're talking about and at a nation level scale, those are the numbers. And they can be a bit hard to get your head around. So uh, I asked my team recently to just put those in things I could explain. So, um, you know, we'll uh, uh, buy and install enough steel uh, to construct 4,000 Burj Khalifas uh, over the next 10 to 12 years. Uh, we will uh, install air conditioning capacity, which is demand for PADI uh, equal to the installed base in the state of California. I mean, these are very big numbers, and so my uh, my call to action, if you will, is uh, to international and local uh, companies to not waste this boom. It is, because there's a great time, I think, at the moment. And um, there's so much happening. This is really the good time to be here. And I think to be talking with everybody and, you know, really seeing how people can partner here and looking at the great opportunities that are there. Because they're here in industry. As I said, they're here in the creative sector. They're here you know, in, in every sector. So it's it's very, very exciting time. I'm doing a supply chain panel later and we're talking about restaurants and all sorts of stuff. But you look around you here and you see just the capabilities. So I just want to thank you all so much for your great insight. You know, thank you for being here and for the great work you've been doing over the years. And they're great success stories that you can share with us. I think these are so important. But you wouldn't be able to share them again without the help of everybody. So it is really that uh, the, the true party. spirit of cooperation, of partnerships here, and of, again, I think driving a single agenda, which is where everybody has their eye on the same goal, 
And I think with that, as somebody talked about earlier today, that certainly makes sure that uh, everybody will get there faster and with greater success. So once again, thank you so much. Thank you. Your Highness, thank Sultan, you. thank you so much. Thank you. Faisal, Patty, and Jerry, thank you all. Thank you.